On the eighth day, God created a farmer. I believe in it. And today, America needs more of them. I'm in farming for life. There's no question about that. Meet the next generation of farmers and see how they're changing the way we eat. I see farming as my mission field. And then. That looks pretty easy. That looks pretty painless. The addiction that brought this cop to the edge of suicide. But okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Hey, it's Monday, and we welcome you to this edition of the 700 Club. There's been some bad news coming out of Iraq, but we finally got a little good news. Uh, the Peshmerga fighters have gotten some ammunition and some weapons. The uh, Iraqi army seems to have stiffened its resolve. And guess what? They recaptured that dam in Mosul that was threatening the entire country. Uh, flood, if broken, it could unleash a flood all the way to Baghdad. But maybe, maybe, maybe now they can get that thing fixed. Wendy. But the terrorists aren't stopping their murderous rampage as they're still killing innocent people in northern Iraq. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Erbil. When ISIS captured the Mosul Dam less than two weeks ago, experts warned the consequences could have been catastrophic. It's not just that ISIS could blow up the dam or could be destroyed in the middle of a battle. The dam needs constant maintenance to keep it from bursting. The U.S. Corps of Engineers once called it the most dangerous dam in the world. If it burst, experts say it would send a wall of water 60 feet high rushing downstream towards Mosul and Baghdad. It's estimated it would have killed as many as five to 600,000 Iraqis. Recapturing the dam is a significant victory for the Peshmerga. U.S. airstrikes played a key role in the offensive. The Pentagon announced they hit a number of ISIS positions near the dam. Local officials say U.S. involvement in the battle against ISIS is invaluable. Every single person in the region, we appreciated that because it changed many things. It's very important to support us because we haven't such a capability to, to stand against these people alone. Some U.S. lawmakers are calling on the Obama administration for an even greater military response to ISIS. Uh, frankly, we need to do everything we can to repel ISIS. I don't think we have the luxury of putting our heads in the sand and saying, well, it's over there and we're not going to do it. I, I think what we're doing now is effective. We've got to do more of it. And ultimately, we, we may have some boots on the ground there. Not something I want, but you know what? We have bad choices, and the worst choice is to do nothing. Unfortunately, uh, President Obama uh, bugged out of Iraq, and that was a strategic and historic blunder, and we're, we're seeing the results of that. So right now, the, what pre the president has to do is he has to assemble a coalition of the willing. The U.S. might find a willing partner in British Prime Minister David Cameron, who warned against the poisonous influence of ISIS in Great Britain. In the meantime, ISIS continued its murderous rampage throughout northern Iraq. Another massacre, this time in the village of Kocho, that followed a gruesome, barbaric, and predictable ISIS pattern. They separated women and children from the men. They put women and children in a hole and put the men on another side. They took their IDs, gold, and properties. Then they took the men, group by group, outside of the village by cars and killed them until no men were left in the village. ISIS gave the residents of Kocho a deadline to convert to Islam. They gathered the villages in a school and promised they could leave. Then they began to murder. Tens of thousands of Yazidis have already fled the ISIS rampage and found refuge in a number of UN refugee camps. ISIS targets minorities like the Yazidis and Christians in its grisly drive to establish an Islamic state in the middle of the Middle East. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Erbil, Northern Iraq. You know, sometimes bad things bring about good results. These people are monsters. They are absolute monsters. Even the uh, moderate uh, Muslims can't stand what they're doing. What this may have done, however, is coalesce uh, these other states into a coalition against uh, ISIS and maybe in favor of Israel, in favor of the United States, because there's no point else for them to go. But uh, this is the true face of Islam. It is Islam right out of the Quran. 
Now, I've got a little booklet here we've been uh, offering to people. We have about 183,000 people who have received this so far, so it's very popular. It's called Islam, Religion of Peace or War. It'll tell you the origin of where some of these philosophies like ISIS come from, and uh, I think it will be very helpful. We'll give it to you free if you give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. Well, they brought in the highway patrol, uh, but it didn't seem to do much good. There was this uh, captain in the Missouri Highway Patrol who got a lot of television time, and he seemed to be speaking sweet reason. But that wasn't enough. The rampage continues. Now the governor of Missouri has called out the National Guard. After yet another night of violent protests in the streets, John Jessup has more of that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Pat, that's right. Governor Jay Nixon called in the guard to Ferguson to help, as he said, in restoring peace and order. The city has been the scene of unrest following the death of Michael Brown, an unarmed black teen killed by a police officer just over a week ago. Police say Johnson and Officer Darren Wilson had some kind of altercation before the shooting. Sunday, hundreds attended a memorial service for Brown. On the streets, peaceful protests gave way to chaos as marchers clashed with police in riot gear. Police and armored vehicles launched tear gas and smoke canisters into the crowd. There were shootings, looting, vandalism, and other acts of violence. We had to act. Meanwhile, the uncle of Michael Brown says his nephew would oppose the violence plaguing the city. Pastor Charles Ewing told his congregation, rioting and looting, looting is not the way, but Jesus is the way. Texas Governor Rick Perry says he did nothing wrong and didn't deserve to be indicted on felony counts of abuse of power. And as Dale Hurd reports, both conservatives and some liberals are criticizing the charges. If I had to do it again, I would make exactly the same decision. Texas Governor Rick Perry is not backing down after being indicted Friday by a Texas grand jury. His misdeed? Cutting the funding for a district attorney, Rosemary Lemberg, who was arrested on a DUI and then acted belligerently toward police. I did what every governor has done for uh, decades, which is make a decision on whether or not it was in the proper uh, use of state money to go to that uh, agency, and I vetoed it. The indictment, barely two pages, has been condemned as politically motivated, with both liberals and conservatives coming out in support of the governor. Liberal Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz told Newsmax that everybody, liberal or conservative, should stand against this indictment. The Wall Street Journal lampooned it as the Texas chainsaw prosecution, and even former Obama advisor David Axelrod called the indictment sketchy. This is why Perry says he cut Lemberg's funding. Here she is failing a sobriety test after being arrested for drunk driving in 2013. This is trying to keep him from tripping over. You don't need to be slapping, a what, slapping his hands away. Then she becomes more combative in jail. Perry said her behavior was unacceptable. Stop for a DWI with a blood alcohol level almost three times the legal limit. Lemberg pleaded guilty and served 45 days in jail. I made a huge mistake, and I spent a lot of time trying to make amends for that. But Lemberg is still in office. A grand jury said the governor abused his authority by trying to force her out. He faces his own arraignment this week. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Pat, your thoughts, is this indictment politically motivated? Are you kidding? Of course it's political. It's outrageous. You know, there's a little conclave of Democrats in the midst of the great state of Texas. They're there in Travis County and apparently in Austin. And uh, you, you get a grand jury. Of course, they say you could indict a ham sandwich if you got the right prosecution. And you got, you, you, the accused doesn't have a chance to offer any defense at all. It's all on the side of the prosecutor. But this is outrageous. Of course a governor, a governor has a right to veto legislation. He has a right to threaten veto of legislation. That's his job. That's what he was elected to do. And here this drunk woman uh, combated with the police, uh, and he says she's not fit to hold this particular important job, and he will veto funding of her uh, organization unless she's removed. Well, what is wrong with that? Well, absolutely nothing. 
This is the political process. And I'm with Alan Dershowitz and anybody else that wants to say this is an outrage. It's an outrage and it, it's a blot on Texas, the Texas justice system. And to let this kind of thing stand is outrageous. They pulled the same stunt on Tom DeLay. They got him uh, embroiled for years. Then finally his conviction was overturned by the Texas uh, Supreme Court. This kind of thing is outrageous with a sitting governor to say he, he threatens a veto or vetoes an appropriation for an organization headed by a drunk woman. And on the strength of that, they're going to uh, convict him. He got no money for it. He had no control over the money involved. He was exercising his constitutional authority and his free speech rights as governor of Texas. And my goodness, how can this thing stand? John. Pat, a controversial Russian convoy is expected to get into Ukraine soon, according to Russia's foreign minister. Moscow insists the 300-truck convoy is simply bringing in humanitarian aid. But some Ukrainian and Western officials suspect it could be a cover for an invasion. The incident once again has raised tensions between Russia and Ukraine and raised fears of more fighting. And in health news, a study earlier this year found that resveratrol in red wine, chocolate and grapes might not be as healthy as previously thought. But take heart, chocolate also contains other ingredients that are good for you. Lori Johnson has that story. Most people know green veggies like broccoli are good for you, and blueberries are rich in healthy antioxidants. Now we're learning more about the cocoa bean, where we get chocolate. Doctors say the antioxidant found in cocoa keeps your blood flowing. Flavonoids are something that, um, depending on what food it is, will help different systems. And so the main flavonoid in chocolate is called flavanol. And flavanol will help to improve blood pressure. It helps the blood to clot better so it doesn't get sticky in the arteries. Chocolate, a health food? It sounds too good to be true. And as it turns out, there actually are a couple catches. Make sure you choose the kind with a high percentage of cocoa because it contains the most flavanols. Unfortunately, flavanols tend to make chocolate taste bitter. And you really want to look for um, dark chocolate and that high percentage of cocoa. You know, maybe that 70%. So the brand doesn't matter. It just um, really matters on the type of chocolate. So that dark chocolate, that high percentage of cocoa. In order to reap the most benefits of chocolate, you only need a small amount. I would recommend one ounce of a dark chocolate a few times a week. I don't think it's something that you have to, you know, have every day. Some people avoid chocolate because it contains fat, but Jeffers says don't worry about that. The stearic acid was shown that it does not um, improve or um, make your cholesterol worse. So that type of saturated fat in chocolate is actually um, okay to have. So chocolate can be good for you. Just go dark and enjoy it in moderation. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Pat, if I remember correctly, don't you have a piece of dark chocolate daily? <laughs> if I can get it, absolutely. You know, it takes away any craving you have for sweets, too. Um, you know, it's a one little square or two or three little squares of that stuff. It keeps your blood pressure down, makes you healthy and happy, and promotes domestic bliss. <laughs> <laughs> promotes domestic bliss. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guess uh, what's going with me to the top of Kilimanjaro? Dark chocolate. Good for you. I don't think I'd make it without it. Well, it'll, it'll be good for you. Don't overdo it. You know, the, the problem is with, with milk chocolate, they've got all kinds of sugar in it and fat and all that that you don't need. But the 72 percent plus if it gets too mm -hmm. much it gets a little bitter but 72 percent is yeah, nice 72 percent is it has some sweetness to yeah, it. it it's it, very it's, nice got something in there but anyhow i'm all for it and uh, uh it it my blood pressure is down so low you can't believe it it's just terrific wow wow i've always had like naturally low yeah. blood pressure well you don't need dark so. chocolate then but climbing that dumb mountain you probably need all the help <laughs> you can get all right hey when are you gonna leave three weeks from now two, two weeks? weeks two weeks from two now? weeks yeah you promise you'll come back and uh there we are there's Ooh. the mountain right there and the giraffes are going to be down below and if anybody wants to follow me uh they can check out my blog wendy's you see that that woman that broke into a zoo and she got kicked in the head by a giraffe i didn't think they <gasps> kicked people I don't know. I'm going to go on a safari while I'm out there, too. So well, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Don't get bit by a lion. Don't get... <laughs>
sound like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look after you, dear. Okay. I What's it. next? Well, we're coming up, a job that requires long hours and hard labor, and the workers wouldn't have it any other way. I like to joke that um, farming is the American royalty. You either are born into or you marry it, or you have a really long struggle to get there. <laughs> <laughs> See what it takes to put food on your table next. Just out of the blue, the pain would hit me and I would fall. My arches were falling, and I also had bone spurs, arthritis, and uh, pneumosis, which is an infection of the foot. The 700 Club was on, and it was the last 10 minutes. Gordon Robertson came on. Uh, there's a woman, you're, you're saying, uh, the soles of your feet. You've, you've got problems with fallen arches in both feet. It's very difficult for you to walk, very painful. God's healing you now. I just had this supernatural knowledge that I was healed. So I stood up and just started jumping up and down like a rabbit, just rejoicing and laughing and crying and hysterical because the pain was gone. My feet were, weren't hurting, my legs weren't hurting, my hip wasn't hurting, my back wasn't hurting. And it was so remarkable. God just wanted me to know He was in the business of healing. He did complete what He started. Our finances were dwindling and we knew that something was really wrong with our business. Our client base was down. We had a lot of debt when we continued to make our offerings. Sowing seeds that the Lord was going to use for His purpose and His glory, and He was going to reward it, and He did. Little by little, things just started getting better. More peace in our house, more love in our house. Give to the Lord what is His first. He'll give everything else to you, and above and beyond, He'll provide for you. Tomorrow. There was blood, my dad was uh, laying in the floor. The charge, murder one. I had no idea what caused any of it. And you won't believe who was guilty of the crime. I went into the courtroom that day and was not going to look at her. A lot of anger and bitterness and uh, resentment had built up. From death row. You become numb to a lot of things. Two lives saved. God was at work. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, that great radio broadcast on the eighth day God made a farmer. Well, the farmers are tremendous, but they're a vanishing breed today. More and more people are not farming. I remember being in Iowa some years ago and meeting with a lovely couple who worked their heads off. They worked 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And I said, when it's all finished in the year, you net how much? They said about eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 from all that work. And they really worked hard. But today, young Americans are growing up with high technology, computers, the Internet. But some of them are saying, we want to go back to the roots. We want to go back to the soil. They want to go back to farming. And as Heather Sills reports, their methods could change the very foods we eat. The U.S. needs to recruit new farmers and fast. With an average age of 57, farmers are aging out just as the world's food needs are growing. By 2050, the population will be about 9 billion people. One answer may lie here on Polyface Farm in Virginia. At midday, farmer Daniel Salatin gives his interns a lesson in haymaking. Throughout the afternoon, they'll take turns loading bales on the tractor and then into the barn. It's hard work, but it's gratifying work. and. You get, you're exhausted by the end of the day, but you're just so happy to be with everybody and fellowship and work together. Believe it or not, hundreds of young people apply every year for the opportunity to intern here at the Salatin Farm. Their reward, the ability to learn the latest in sustainable farming. I think that that, that pendulum is beginning to swing around now to where um, young people are beginning to realize uh, you know, just just sitting in a Dilbert cubicle working for the man in a Fortune 500 company doesn't do it for me. You know, I wanna I wanna touch what I've made. Salatin attracts internship seekers from around the country, and turns away hundreds each year. Many wannabe farmers have read at least one of his dozen books, respect his sustainable methods, and envy his million dollar operation. Tim Rohr fled his California desk job to learn from Salatin who he calls the Steve Jobs of agriculture. 
being here, I don't know, there's been many days we've worked so far that haven't been less than 12 hours a day yet. I'm up and ready to go the next day, and it's just because there's a passion for, for doing it. You know, I believe in it. Part of that passion is driven by a desire to help fix our country's unhealthy eating problem. On Salatin's farm, interns learn the latest in regenerative farming techniques. No pesticides, no fertilizers, no hormones. Everything here is natural. I really am very, you know, concerned about health and nutrition and the way we grow foods and the way that that affects us. And for many of these interns, their walk with Christ is also a motivation. Faith plays a big role um, for me. I, I see farming as my mission field. Come on, ladies. Ben Beichler runs a That's dairy good. farm a few hours away. He credits his Polyface internship with jump-starting his farming career. So much of what we do here on the farm is experiences, like knowing what you're looking for, knowing what um, to do if you get in a tight situation. And Polyface gave me real life experiences where, yo, know, cows got out and things broke down. Since his internship, Beichler has faced the same challenges that deter many of today's young farmers. The main obstacles, land and money. I like to joke that um, farming is the American royalty. You either are born into or you marry it or you have a really long struggle to get there. <laughs> so far, he's getting by managing a small herd that supplies his in-laws creamery business. For others, like Jordan Green, working land that others have written off gives them a start. Green leases several properties in the Blue Ridge Mountains, overseeing everything from chickens to what's called forested pork. Think pigs feasting on grass, berries, and nuts. I like doing something different every day and enjoying you know, working outdoors, working with animals. The Department of Ag hopes to recruit more young farmers and ranchers like Green. It's spending 20 million a year to tout farming and help them get started. But there's nothing more rewarding than working with the land, knowing that you grew something that other people can eat. The real question, just where is the market for local organic food headed? Most industry watchers doubt it will become mainstream, but see it continuing to grow as a niche market. I see sustainable farming becoming more and more uh, plausible and viable. What will also help the energy and dedication these young farmers bring to their work and ultimately to our tables. I know it's what I'm supposed to do, so at the end of the day, it's, it's gonna happen. I'm in farming for life. There's no question about that. Heather Sells, CBN News. Oh, it brings back nostalgia for those of us who used to be farming as we were kids. Living off the land. Oh, it so sounds so romantic. romantic. Yeah. <laughs> I used to get up, I think, at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and we were knocking off maybe at 9 o'clock at night. And uh, I remember uh, I'd be out there in the fields, and it would be broiling hot. Mm. And I would see the road crew, the convicts, they'd bring them out drop them on the road. I had already been working for a couple hours. There they were out scraping around on the road. And then about 4.30 in the afternoon, they'd have a truck and pick them back up. And I'd think, man, if I can just get a job on that road crew. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you don't want to do what <laughs> yeah. they did to get there. <laughs> no, no, I don't. But I mean, talking about easy compared to farming. Do you guys have, you had animals too? Oh, yeah. We, we cows, uh, chickens. And I used to, you know, slop the hogs and feed the chickens. and. And uh, I ride the horse. I didn't. We didn't eat the horses, but we rode them. And uh, wow. uh, the cows. You know, and of course. It you is. know, people are getting so educated now on food that they they want to go back to nature. They want that organ Bad. those organic eggs. I know when I go to the supermarket, I buy the cage free chicken Bad. eggs because I'm thinking they're they're happier well, it, chickens. It, they're making it's, better tasting it's, eggs. It, it sounds think? very romantic, but it's not uh, very practical in terms of making money because it's it's mass produced. The money crop we had on this farm is a thousand acres, was about six acres of potatoes. And uh, I learned among other things, you picked up potatoes and you stooped over and yeah, I used to haul those 100 pound sacks oh, of potatoes man. hour after hour after hour. But in any event, that was the big money crop, potatoes. potatoes. So they sold them to the supermarkets up in Washington. But anyhow, it's farming, and it's romantic. <laughs> and why not? I mean, it's, it's romantic. Maybe I need to marry a farmer. Uh, they get okay, a little, we'll they get a little the smelly, too. <laughs> you know, one bath on Saturday night. Go ahead. Woo. All right. Well, up next, a farm girl who couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't even stand up to walk to go to the bathroom. I had to crawl there, crawl back.
I could function sometimes. Others, I would just have to lay down and try to sleep it off. And this went on for more than 20 years until the day she was healed in an instant. Find out how it happened next. Introducing the CBN Bible from CBN.com. Now, an easier way to study the Bible and grow in your faith. I liked your favorite verse. Read separate versions at a glance. Click and read a commentary. Or cross-reference your favorite verse using the Strong's Concordance. All the right tools to study the Bible. All in one place. The CBN Bible. Available at CBN.com Bible or the iTunes App Store. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Vertigo, it's a classic Hitchcock film about a detective who got dizzy at tall heights. But for Becky Darrington, Vertigo is more than a movie. It's something she lived with for over 20 years. Mornings are coffee first. Again, I have breakfast with my husband and we sit and chat. That's one of my favorite times of the day is mornings with Bill. It is beautiful. And I love it. I love being on the farm. Life on the farm wasn't always an idyllic place for Becky Darrington. She'd been dealing with vertigo off and on for 21 years. Her symptoms started in the late 80s. Some days were debilitating. Vertigo is when you get dizzy, lightheaded. I couldn't even stand up to walk to go to the bathroom. I had to crawl there, crawl back, and just get in bed. I could function sometimes. Others, I would just have to lay down and try to sleep it off. After three years of sporadic dizzy spells, Becky saw a doctor. I went to the doctor and she gave me some medication for the dizziness. It helped, but it put me to sleep. Totally put me under. She saw another doctor in 2008. It got worse as the years went on. And I just lived with it. Three years later, Becky was home doing her usual chores around the house. The 700 Club was on. I was at my dining room table folding towels, and Terry was on, and she was praying for other people that had, you know, ailments and sicknesses. Then Pat Robertson started praying. Somebody has problems with an ear, inner ear infection. You're dizzy. You you have a hard time with balance. Right now, God is just reaching into that inner ear. He is completely healing it. You are healed. Put your hand over the ear, wherever, or both your ears. In the name of Jesus, be made whole. I was in the middle of folding a towel, and when I had that thought, I could be healed from this. And I had a sensation from the top of my head that went all the way down my neck, my shoulders, to the middle of my body. It went all the way down to my feet. And I knew immediately that instance, the vertigo, it was gone at that point. It's been three years and no signs of vertigo. I 100% knew God had laid his hand upon me. I felt it. It was physical. It was beautiful. It's about what the Lord can do, what Jesus Christ can do in his timing. He is with us every day and loves us. Wow. That's, that's a miracle. That, that is. is wonderful. Uh, Wendy, we're going to pray for some people, but here's somebody uh, uh, from uh, Kent, Ohio, Judy. She had 
celiac disease. The dietary restrictions cause her to have a marital overload, bringing about depression. She took antidepressants, but she was foggy, dizzy, having problems all the time. And then one uh, last month, she was watching our program, and you had a word, Wendy, that described her condition. And guess what? Judy uh, in Iron Spring, Ohio, was healed. Praise God. All right, we have from uh, Anne in Vancouver, else? Washington. She injured her right knee, uh, torn knee membranes from two separate falls. The doctors could not repair the knee, so they would give her cortisone shots every four months, but the pain remained. One day, Anne was watching the 700 Club before she left for her doctor's appointment, and she heard you say, Pat, a knee that is sore is being healed. And went to take her shower, and when she got out, she realized her knee no longer hurt. She has not had any more shots. There's no pain, and she's giving God the glory for the healing. Praise God. Folks, you know, God is so great. He is so wonderful. He has such power. Yes. You know, that lady had problems in the inner ear for years and years and years and years. The Lord God just reached out and touched her. It was done. Just a touch. All God's got to do is speak the word. Like the man said, speak the word and my servant will be healed. Just speak the word. All God's got to do is speak the word. Mm -hmm. And we believe God. Nothing is impossible. Now, you may be in a wheelchair. You say, I've been there for years. Nothing's impossible. God can get you out of that wheelchair. He can give you de deliverance from depression. Whatever the problem, He's greater than any of your problems. Now, we're going to join hands. We're going to believe God. The two of us will believe God for you. I'm going to ask you to stop what you're doing right now. And whatever the problem, let's pray. Yes. Wendy and I will join hands together. Father, in Jesus' name, I join hands with Wendy. And we agree at this moment for those in this audience. Somebody's got a terrible uh, sickness. You, you, you're upset stomach. You, you're vomiting. It's like you, you can't control it. And you're just, you've just cried out to God, God, help me. God just helps you. You're completely healed. Yes. Wendy. There's a man, and uh, you had seizures. You were up all night last night, and you were having seizures. And uh, God is just healing you right now from those. You're not going to have those again. And just receive that in Jesus' name. Somebody else with night sweats is a virus uh, that's in your system, and God has just taken care of that. He eliminated the virus, and you are healed in the name of Jesus. Someone with, um, it's like almost like chronic laryngitis. You just haven't been able to get your voice back. And just put your hand right now. God says he's healing you right now. Just put your hand right on your throat, on your vocal cords. You're being healed in Jesus' name. I ask right now for the presence of God to touch you, that the people who are suffering from financial problems, yes. emotional problem, there's several marriages. One, Bill and Jane, marriage. You're fighting each other. Mm -hmm. It's little squabbles that really don't amount to anything. And God's suddenly giving you a flood of love for your spouse in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Wendy. All right, my turn. Still ahead. We've got your email questions. Kathleen says, I was 12 weeks pregnant when I miscarried. Will I see my baby in heaven? We'll bring it on with that question and much more next. It hindered my ability to walk or run. I had to uh, cancel lessons all the time and cancel all the programs that I had planned. And I saw my career gone. I had never really understood the purpose of money even and what my responsibilities were. And I always thought that we well, had to have a lot to give. And the more I gave, the more kids would come. I would like to say, you know, it's my great skills or something. It's not. I'm giving to God. I'm obeying. I'm obedient. That's it. I chose CBN because it helped me find a way to, to help change the world for Christ. 
My business has grown five times what it was in 2005. Five times that. I think any type of investment or any type of giving is an act of faith. I can't, to be honest with you, I can't wait to write the check. It's the best investment that I can imagine. It, you can't outgive God. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The U.S. Navy has ordered that the Gideon Bibles removed from lodges earlier this month be returned. They said the decision to remove the Bibles was made without consulting senior leadership. The removal was part of a new policy from Rear Admiral Robert Bianchi with the Navy Exchange Service Command. The American Family Association said the move came after a complaint from the atheist group, the Freedom From Religion Foundation. A short film from CBN's Chinese ministry website, 7G.TV, won the highest award at a gospel film festival in Asia. The award was presented at a ceremony in Taiwan at this year's Global Chinese Gospel Short Film Golden Eagle Awards. The theme of the contest was Father. CBN's film focused on a father's love for his adopted son who had a life-threatening tumor. The purpose of the Christian Film Festival is to encourage Chinese churches and Christians to use the power of digital media and film to share the good news. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Wendy will be back right after this. When the market crashed, I was sitting with 36 properties and about $6 million in debt. It felt like the weight of the world on me. And every night I would go to bed crying. I think that, you know, God could bring a message from this mess if He wants to. And I'm going to surrender this to Him and I'm going to trust Him and I'm just going to see what He does. I do believe giving made all the difference. And I think that where we put our money is where we put our faith. The Bible says that when we give to the Lord, He sees that. Uh, if it's your time of need, that is actually the best time to give. It's the greatest opportunity for the greatest return. He taught me so much about His grace, His unmerited favor and undeserved blessing. God wants to bless us when we give to Him. We can't outgive God. Take away everything he has from Superbook, and he will surely curse you to your face. This month, Job. God sometimes tests those he loves. He should be angry with God for what has happened. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook Job, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. And as a part of our Superbook Summer Bonus, receive three additional Superbook episodes featuring the greatest heroes of the Bible, absolutely free. The Superbook Hero Pack includes a giant adventure, Roar! And Esther, for such a time as this. I will go in to see the king. Yes! Join the Superbook DVD Club today, and for a limited time, receive the Superbook Hero Pack as our way of saying thanks. Job never lost his faith in God. Well, welcome back. We are so excited about our new Superbook offer. It's called the Hero Pack, and it includes three Job DVDs, that's our latest one, and one DVD of each of the following episodes, A Giant Adventure, Roar, and Esther. And to get your hero pack, just join our Superbook DVD club for $25. Your credit card or debit card will be charged whenever a new DVD is released. And for more information, you can call 1-800-759-0700, or you can log on to CBN.com, and you want to get all of these. They're Good. awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. It's time to bring it on. We All have some right. great questions today for Pat. And Kathleen writes in. Me. She says, I was 12 weeks pregnant when I miscarried and lost the baby. My family has different ideas on what happened to the baby. I really want to know if my baby is in heaven and if I will see him again one day. Will he be a baby or grown? Thank you so much. Um, you know, that young man who died momentarily went to heaven and apparently saw little child, a uh, little girl who was a, <clears throat> a sister uh, who had been miscarried and who was now a little girl. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says uh, in Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you, I knew you. Uh, so we have existence before conception. We have existence at conception. And uh, presumably, if a child dies uh, before maturity, that child will live before the Lord. But I, I, I can't give you any Bible references to back that up. So this is just my feeling. You're asking me, what do I think? And I think you'll see that little baby, and the little baby will be at least grown up part of the way, maybe all the way. She right? should definitely see the Heaven is for Real, the movie. They, that's true. They, they, they've Doug. got a little girl in there, so yeah. but they, that, that still isn't biblical, but it's, it's, it's something that happened, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Paul writes, uh, with all the different Bible translations available, what do you feel is the best version? Um, I, I like the NIV. I use the NIV, the, the New International Version. It's done by some scholars involved with Zondervan. Uh, I've always liked the New American Standard. It's very accurate. It's, it, it doesn't read quite as well as the NIV, uh, but all of them are much closer to the original Greek. You see, they, they, they have manuscripts. You have to translate from something, and the better manuscripts are being discovered with biblical research. And they have these massive, what they call codices, the Vaticanus, the Alexandrinus, the, uh, so forth. Uh, and, and they take those, the Sinaiticus, and, and they, they use those against fragments that have been discovered, the writings of church fathers, et cetera. And out of that comes uh, a pretty good consensus. But uh, they're better manuscripts than what, for example, you have in the King James, which are uh, translated much later. I All really right. have a hard time with the King James, but I like the new King James. Well, it's good, you know. but it, it still doesn't have the accuracy of the NIV, the and, NIV. The, and the new, new American Standard. All right. Okay, great. Good advice there. Well, Scott writes, Dear Pat, I've been on my knees in constant prayer for almost a week now, asking the Lord to give me a bass <laughs> voice before the school year starts. I'm not sure if he's heard me or, or if it's selfish to ask. I'm only 15, and I love gospel music. Would you please help me by answering this? I'll tell you a story. One of my dear, dear friends and board member here at CBN was Harold Bradis, and Harold is a wonderful man. Well, he was almost bald. <laughs> so a man named Pat Boone called him, getting ready to shoot a show about Dave Wilkerson, you know, crossing the switchback. Yeah, Dave Wilkerson. And Pat asked Harold, uh, would you pray that I might grow some more hair? And Harold said, I'll, here he's a bald man. He said, I'll pray for no such thing. <laughs> so you're asking prayer for your voice to get deeper. Uh, God can give you an answer like that, but uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, God will let you mature at the rate he wants you to, and you have a great future ahead of you. And so all I can say is don't rush it. And so in any event, Bald-headed people don't normally pray for people to get hair. <laughs> right. what else? And maybe you're going to be a great uh, singer, yeah, well, just he, not a bass maybe singer. He's a, they used to keep them uh, in Rome. They, they, they liked those boy tenors. All yeah. Right. All right. A viewer writes, what does it mean when the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it? I've heard you say that's, that something must have gone wrong in the upbringing of adult children that have chosen a wrong path. Does this scripture guarantee your children will serve God if you're a Christian parent? People are very quick to blame the parents for the decisions their children make when they become adults. Um, well, it's... A a nice principle. It doesn't necessarily apply to every situation, nor do we know what goes on in some household. <clears throat> Raise up a child in the way he'll go. If you train a child from early days to be polite, to be courteous, to be honest, uh, to be respectful of authority, to learn the Bible, uh, how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to his word. So uh, is the word of God living in the minds of these young people? And the Bible says if you give him training of that nature, when he gets older, that training will correct him and, and uh, he'll, he'll abide by those principles. But who knows what happens in somebody's life? You say they're good Christians. They go to church uh, once a Sunday. Well, big deal. What happens at home? Do they fight? Do they squabble? Are they fair? Are they just with the child? Do they have family devotions? You know, I don't know what the training is. None of us do. So uh, uh, only God knows. So but the general principle is if you take a young child, you're early, two years old, three years old, four years old, five years, six years, and 
every day you teach them these things, they will live for the Lord. That's what you, your hope is. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I, I, as a parent, I, I, I say what my theory was. Wean that child away from you as fast as you can. Wean them to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they come to you and say, what should I do? Well, you go ask the Lord, what does he tell you? Get them to learn to listen to the voice of the Lord. Let them to walk with him. That's the key. Okay. Wow, that is awesome advice. I never heard that before. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, coming up, right. a policeman trapped in a vicious cycle. You wake up thinking about pornography. You go to bed thinking about pornography. Mm -hmm. You get to such a place of despondency. You have nothing. You, you, you just feel uh, uh, like a pervert. See how shame and guilt drove this officer to the brink of suicide and hear three words that saved his life. I moved up. I moved up. We've moved up. CBN partners are moving up in order to give more people hope. Partners who increase their existing monthly pledge move up to the next giving level, bringing their compassion to children and adults here and in 36 countries around the world. Thank you, CBN partners, for all you do, because when you move up, thousands of hurting people move up in life as well. Houston, I moved up. You know, what changed was that I no longer was looking at me that if it works out in the NFL, it's because God wants me there and it's for me to do something for him. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think back to those years when I tried to do it by myself and I just, I think about my life now and I think about, you know, marriage and seven kids and I'm just thinking, there was no way I could figure this out and be successful by myself. That I know it's all about Jesus and that's why we are where we are. Tomorrow. There was blood and my dad was uh, laying in the floor. The charge, murder one. I had no idea what caused any of it. And you won't believe who was guilty of the crime. I went into the courtroom that day and was not going to look at her. A lot of anger and bitterness and uh, resentment had built up. From death row. You become numb to a lot of things. Two lives saved. God was at work. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, we're glad you're with us. You're watching The 700 Club. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you very much. I want you to know that if you have a problem, you need help, somebody's here. These telephones are available 24 hours a day for you. Well, imagine an addiction to pornography that's so intense. You put a gun to your head to stop the madness that's going on in your life. Well, that's just what the police officer in the next story did. He squeezed the trigger. The hammer started to move back in his service revolver. And then he heard three little words that stopped him from blowing his brains out. Shame, guilt, embarrassment. Uh, you know, I, I knew it was wrong. Born and raised in the church, I knew it was wrong. Just one look at a porn magazine, and 10-year-old Chris Amos was hooked. It gave him a sense of power, acceptance, even love, things a boy unsure of himself needed. And here are the most beautiful women in the world, right? And they're there to meet your every need. They're there to accept you. You want unconditional love? Look at pornography. But he quickly learned there was a flip side. And as soon as that need is met, immediately comes the guilt and the shame and the, you know, the worthlessness and the self-condemnation. Inside, I, I was just tormented. In, inside, there was a hopelessness growing. Inside, I was somehow resolved to the fact that, well, this is my destiny. This is my life. After high school, Chris joined the Norfolk, Virginia Police Department. He also married Anne Marie, and they attended church regularly. Even then, he couldn't shake his addiction. You wake up thinking about pornography. You go to bed thinking about pornography. You get to such a place of despondency. 
where you have no self-esteem, no self-worth, no self-value. You have nothing. You, you just feel uh, uh, like a pervert. At times, he took off from work without telling his wife so he could frequent the go-go bars and adult video stores. He grew accustomed to lying to cover his tracks until his first child was born. I realized I could lie to my wife, I could lie to my co-workers, could lie to my family, could lie to my pastor and, and still function. But when I looked into the eyes of my newborn son, uh, something just, I, I can't lie to him. I, I mean, he deserves better. Anne-Marie certainly deserved better. And that, that's when suicide, the first thoughts of suicide began to enter into my mind. Chris thought about killing himself for weeks. One day on a call, he made up his mind. I remember as I'm walking into the townhouse hearing a gunshot. And there's this 18-year-old young man who had just shot himself, still bleeding from the side of his head. And the thought is really cemented. Well, that doesn't look too bad. That looks pretty easy. That looks pretty painless. I think that kind of sealed the deal. That okay, this is this is what I'm going to do. Chris waited until his wife and son left the house. And I remember first putting it in my mouth, then to the side of my head, and watching this whole thing in a mirror and starting to squeeze the trigger and the hammer starting to move back. At that moment, Chris heard a voice. And it simply says three words. There is hope. There is hope. Chris put down the gun. He believes the voice that stopped him was God's. That was just enough light, just enough hope. To, to, to pierce that darkness that had become my life. Chris knew he had to tell his wife about his addiction, but he didn't know how, so he left adult videos out for her to find. All I could do was drop to my knees and just pray in the name of Jesus, first of all, that you will protect my marriage and that you would protect Chris and that you would help me to work through this and love him anyway. Now that she knew, Anne-Marie kept an eye out for Chris. Building trust would take some time. But more importantly, she prayed. And there was hope in that because remember, uh, I had been totally alone in this addiction. No one, parents, no one knew. She was the first person to ever know on the face of this earth uh, what I was going through. So I, I gained hope from that. But Chris's journey to healing had barely begun. First, he had to regain his wife's trust. And there were times that um, I, you know, may have sensed something was up. And I would just tell him, I just want you to know I'm praying for you and you're going you're gonna to win. And while in church one night, he says God spoke to him again. It's time to step out from behind the masks, the lies, the deceit, the deception. Satan has robbed you of over half of your life. It's time to put an end to this. And... Uh, there was an altar call at the end of the service. I grabbed Anne-Marie by the hand. We went forward. I knelt down. And, and for the first time, uh, I, I, I prayed, Father, forgive me for the hell that my life has become. And the only way I can describe it, it's as if God walked up, Jesus Christ walked up as I'm kneeling, key in hand, put it in a padlock, unlocked this padlock, 14 years in the making, and just started to unwind this chain. Uh, that, that had become my life. And uh, I got up from that altar, first time I, I can remember not feeling like a pervert. First time I can remember feeling clean, feeling uh, like I was worth something. Chris admits that until that moment, he had never let God into his life, despite years of going to church. With his new faith in Christ, he found strength to fight and overcome his addiction to pornography. Now married for 27 years, he has three grown children and two grandsons. 
I am more dependent on the Lord now than I was, you know, the, the night I was saved, the night I invited Christ into my life. And I'll never ever forget my past. I'll never forget what God's delivered me from. But I don't live there. And it should give anyone out there hope that no matter where you're at, the pain you feel is real. The, the, the loneliness, the, the devastation, those things are all real. But the hope of Jesus Christ is, uh, is, is real too. The hope in Christ is real. There is hope. What a wonderful message. What a message for all of us. There's hope. You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ made a show of them openly triumphing in His cross. Made a show of them openly. The thing about pornography, it's secret. You're secretly looking at the computer. You're secretly looking at the X-rated movies. You're secretly slipping into some of the little places. Uh, you know, the pornography is, is very sed seductive, but it's secret. It's secret. You don't tell anybody about it. I mean, you know, I like porn. Well, more and more people are saying that, but uh, the average person doesn't want his wife, doesn't want her, her husband, doesn't want anybody to know about it. So it's secret. And the Bible says he made a show of them openly. Chris walked forward, basically said, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. He made a show of them openly, triumphing in his cross. The cross of Jesus Christ will give you triumph over whatever the problem is. And that's a story of hope. There is hope. I'll give you something if you want it. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Trapped in Temptation. It's a little booklet that will give you a hand if you give us a call. Uh, it's here for you, and I'll give you that or anything else we can do to help you. But if you want prayer, just pick up your phone and call in or log on to CBN.com. We're here for you. Don't be ashamed. Jesus Christ bore the penalty of your shame. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program. We leave you with our Power Minute from Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Well, tomorrow, scenes from death row with a mom and a date with the electric chair. You don't want to miss this gripping story. That's on tomorrow's 700 Club. So for Wendy and for all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we look forward to seeing you again the same time. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, there was blood. My dad was uh, laying in the floor. The charge, murder one. I had no idea what caused any of it. And you won't believe who was guilty of the crime. I went into the courtroom that day and was not going to look at her. A lot of anger and bitterness and uh, resentment had built up. From death row, you become numb to a lot of things. Two lives saved. God was at work. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Wouldn't it be great if you could just hop on a plane and fly to a third world country and hand out food and medicine to the needy? And wouldn't it be great if some of those people came to know Jesus as their savior because of your help? And wouldn't it be great if you could help out people like this all around the world every day? Wouldn't that make you feel great? And what if you could do all of this without having to leave your home or write monthly checks? Well, you can. Partner with CBN and you can help spread the gospel all around the world and make it a better place. And when you sign up for Pledge Express, your contribution will be deducted from your bank account every month automatically. It's a safe and simple way to make a difference. Plus, wouldn't it be great to get life-changing teachings every month from Pat and Gordon? 
When you sign up for Pledge Express, you'll save time and money. And you won't just sit around and watch the world go by. You'll help change it for the glory of God. Now, wouldn't that be great? 